1984 are written on your jacket. <laughs> Jamie Parker. I'm the member for Balmain, the local member of parliament in this area representing the Greens in the New South Wales Parliament. And I am stoked to see so many people here. Give yourselves a big, big shout out to John I wanted to kick off by saying one thing before I introduce Scott, and that is this question about metadata and what's happening in the federal parliament being a federal issue. Well, I want to give you an interesting statistic from here in New South Wales. In the last financial year that we have data for, which is 2012-2013, in New South Wales, the New South Wales Police had 120,000 unwarranted, unwarranted accesses to personal metadata. 120,000 separate occasions. So that gives you a sense across the whole country, about one third here, and what we're concerned about in New South, New South Wales, of course, is that with changes federally, it will unchain the agencies, here in New South Wales to allow for even more intrusion into your personal metadata and your personal information. So I wanted to really welcome a fantastic guest that we have here tonight. You'll know that in the Federal Parliament and in the New South Wales Parliament we've got a whole lot of Greens working on a range of different issues. I'm really delighted to have Scott uh, Ludlam here tonight. Give him a shout out first. Tonight is a little bit about politics, it's a little bit about the law, but mostly it's about rights, mostly it's about us. So I'm going to only speak for 10 or 15 or so, or less if I can manage. And then we're going to hand over to Daniel, which is what this is about, who's going to actually get a little bit hands-on and just run a workshop about basic skills in cryptography, how to protect your communications, up to a point, how to be anonymous online, up to a point. Um, so really, I'm only here um, kind of for context. And just, I guess, maybe start answering a little bit closer. How about that? Yes. I was worried it was speeding back. All right. About what happens when, when politics and law actually fails us, and I, for one, have had an absolute fucking gutful of the two-party system. And Tonight's about what we do uh, when that system fails us. And so if you came here maybe feeling a little bit powerless about what uh, you know politicians do and stuff in our name in far off places, we're hoping that you leave knowing a few more people than you came uh, and arrived knowing and also having some skills and having a sense of agency and collective power because that's never been needed more than right now. All right, so you'd probably be reasonably well aware that there's a bill at the moment for mandatory data retention. So two years for a very specific data set for every service provider in the country, for every device in the country. Quick show of hands, who here uses a mobile phone? All right, so this is about you. Uh, if you use the internet, this is about you. If you use you know, the banking system, this is about you. It's about all of us. And uh, so a bill uh, that the government actually originally wanted passed in December, then originally they wanted it passed last week or, you know, a couple of weeks ago. It actually did pass the House of Representatives on Thursday. And the politicians, with one or two exceptions, who had been, you know, steadfastly supporting it all the way through, none of them had actually seen the amendments to the bill. And they spent two and a half days roughly debating a bill that none of them had actually read. And I think in this day and age for the Labour Party to be taking Tony Abbott on trust on anything at all is absolutely unbelievable. And so when that was finally put to the vote, you'll have seen Adam Band, our amazing member from Melbourne, uh, Kathy McGowan and Andrew Wilkie were the only three who voted against it. And a bit of an undercurrent in this thing for me, because I suspect we'll see something quite similar when this debate rolls into the Senate next week, is that there's something about those two parties. Because a lot of the people in the Liberal Party, and I know this for a fact, and in the Labour Party, God knows what the Nationals are up to, could be freaking out about how you're about to pinch two seats off them in Northern New South Wales. But apart from that, the major parties, a little bit of feedback. The major parties have rolled over on this thing, even though a lot of them desperately disagree with the policy. So we have to get more Greens and more independents into state and federal parliaments, because otherwise this is going to happen to us again and again. 30, Oh, hang on, is that what it is? Hold on. 
30 pages of amendments got presented to the House of Representatives after the second reading debate had already gone through, and then they chopped it in in under two hours. So I spent chunks of this weekend going through those amendments, and that's what we're going to be debating when it comes through to us in the Senate. Um, and it will likely pass on Thursday, and this is the problem with major party collusion and Abbott short and handshake deals, is that there's not a lot, even though there's 10 Greens in the Senate, there's not a huge amount that we can do. We will try to amend it, we will try to delay it, we will try to block it, but actually it depends on politicians elected by other people than Green supporters as to the final um, fallout. And God, what a ruckus we've kicked up, quite seriously. We have freaked them the hell out. Uh, the major media proprietors descended on Canberra last week and the week before last demanding changes and they were partially successful. And I don't know if you've noticed, actually you have, because probably you were a big part of this occurring, uh, Labor spokespeople can't move online and can't talk about any issue at all on Facebook or Twitter without us and thousands and thousands of people like us clagging up their social media fields saying, well, hang on a second, that's all very well, but why are you selling out our privacy? Why are you, uh, Australian Labor Party, throwing Tony Abbott a $400 million mass surveillance lifeline? Are you out of your minds? Even if the policy was a good idea, the politics of it are diabolical. This guy needs an opposition and he's not getting one. The reason that this is of concern is in a democracy, Australia among many, the way that the balance has been struck in democracies between the power of the state to intrude massively into your private life and the power or the rights of the citizenry uh, not to have state or corporate intrusion into our lives is with a thing called a warrant. And what that effectively means is if you are a person of interest, if you're suspected of a serious crime, if you're suspected of high-level corruption, or if you're a national security threat, uh, we empower agencies with very severe and intrusive powers, actually, to fill out affidavits, to go to the courts, and to get a warrant. And that's quite arduous, actually. The, the kind of hurdles for getting one of those is moderately high. Uh, David would probably argue not high enough, uh, given the history of what's happened here and elsewhere. But nationally, there's about 4,700 warrants sought for and authorised. And across 23 million people, you think, all right, it's not terrifying. That doesn't sound like a system that's completely out of control, although it could certainly do with some improvements. But that's the warranted system. Uh, Jamie mentioned before the New South Wales Police saw and were granted 120,000 warrantless requests for information. Uh, that's out of a total of about 330,000. And you'll see different numbers depending on who it's reported to, because that number ranges up to 700,000. Warrantless authorizations for your private mobile phone and internet telecommunications data every year. More than 700,000. And that's a system that's basically out of control. And it's open season already on our private information. And what Abbott and Brand has proposed to do is force communications providers to start storing, you know, masses more material and effectively bulk warehouses full of private information onto a system that's already fundamentally broken. So one of the amendments that you'll see us lead when this comes to the Senate is an amendment that we are calling, in shorthand, get a warrant. Get a warrant. Yes, you can do your job. But if it's okay to get a warrant to listen in on a phone call, it should be appropriate to get a warrant to track someone's movements all around the landscape. That's a gross invasion of privacy. So that's kind of where we're heading. The system's a bit broken, they're proposing to make it worse. This is, Australia is not alone in having come to this kind of mindset of mass surveillance as opposed to targeted and discriminate surveillance. And it's borrowing from an agreement that was signed between the United States government and the UK after the second, right after the Second World War, the so-called um, Yakuza Agreement, that then evolved and mutated into the Five Eyes Agreement. And that's partly how come we have these relatively poorly known surveillance bases like Echelon, uh, like uh, Kojarina on the West Coast, we've got Pine Gap and others around the place, that after 9-11, 2001, the Bush and Cheney administrations kind of flipped the switch on the US National Security Agency towards a doctrine that was informally known and it splattered all over the, the slides that Edward Snowden released of collective all. You know, if we're looking for needles in a haystack, we're going to collect the whole damn haystack. We're going to collect every piece of signals intelligence that we can so that we can go back and mine it later. And it's, if you can, I hope you can appreciate what a fundamental change that is from targeted and discriminate judicial oversight process that's embodied in the warrant, which is how democracies have kind of resolved that issue or that, that tension up until then. 
Now we have this doctrine of collect it all, and that is precisely what the Australian government is proposing with this mandatory data retention thing. To take a system that's broken, we're going to apply it, we're going to justify it on grounds of corruption, uh, child sexual abuse, really serious, horrific stuff, national security threats, but actually it's not targeted at those people at all. It's not targeted at anyone, it's targeted at everyone. And that's, that fundamental principle is obviously not addressed in any of the work that the committee did, which is one of the reasons why we're not satisfied with the amendments that came forward. So, as I said before, this event is not really about politics and not really just about the law. It's about campaigning and it's about getting some skills. And if I could just invite you in the next seven or eight days, depending on how long it takes, to see if we can delay or amend or push this bill off a cliff somehow, is if you can just please keep doing what you're doing, because I can tell you it's working and it's got Labor running scared. It's partly why we decided to hold this forum here tonight. This is not about some remote thing happening in Canberra. It actually affects all of us and Labor need to be taught a lesson. And if the worst thing that comes out of this is that the Greens pinch three or four seats off, or well, maybe two or three seats off Labor here in Sydney and another couple off the Nats for good measure in the Northern Rivers, then that wouldn't be the worst thing that could happen. The Labor Party has to stop taking people, particularly young people, for granted, which I think they've done for far too long. So, our campaign kind of melted Bill Shorten's phone during the week as well, which was pretty, <laughs> was kind of funny. Um, a friend of mine, Jacob Applebaum, some of you might have come across, is a very, very smart uh, American guy, programmer. The first one being, well, I'm sure it's not happening, you know, the team for that. It's not possible the governments could be engaged in massive, indiscriminate dragnet surveillance of entire populations. Is that the blue screen again, or just a blue screen? <laughs> just a minute. So that's stage one, it isn't happening. And uh, stage two then is, oh, okay, it is happening. I've read a little bit about this Edward Snowden guy. Actually, governments are involved in massive indiscriminate dragnet surveillance of the entire planet, but I'm not doing anything wrong, so obviously this doesn't affect me. And the third stage of that psychology is to hell with that, I'm taking countermeasures. That should be unlawful, and if it's not, I'm gonna protect myself. And so that's really why we're here tonight. Um, Quick show of hands, who, who would consider themselves to have some degree of technical skills in cryptography or moving around the net anonymously? Just hot hands up, okay. Keep your hands up if you're with the New South Wales Police or ASIO. <laughs> One or two. I'm kind of half joking, um, they're probably here, maybe not ASIO, because they probably actually genuinely have better things to do. But it would be very unusual if there weren't one or two spooks in the room. Like, seriously, they wouldn't be doing their job if they weren't here. So, just briefly, in terms of expectation management, uh, this, if you do have some technical skills, we're kind of inviting you to be participatory and to help, particularly when we get around the workshoppy stuff. Uh, if you see people who are looking for some assistance, please provide it. But most particularly, please challenge any of the ideas. We'll run a Q&A session after the workshop. Uh, very happy to have these ideas challenged and put, put to a test. But if you have skills, this is actually about sharing and building community rather than us just bombarding you from here. And if you don't have technical skills, then this is for you. But be warned, you won't walk out of here as sophisticated as Edward Snowden. Uh, people study this stuff for years and years. There's only so much that we can do in an hour and a half or so. So this is effectively just 101. And the first thing you learn, or the first little thing I learned is, well, who's your adversary? Who are you actually trying to protect your stuff from? And if it's the NSA, quite frankly, we're probably buggered. But fortunately, fortunately, they're probably actually not that interested in us. But what we've sort of discovered, I guess, in the last 15 or 18 months or so, is a lot of us have the digital equivalent of our front doors wide open. So it's just about taking basic precautions. Uh, and really just giving you a few pointers about where to look next. The fact is, if, these, if encryption tools didn't work, if strong encryption didn't work, there is no possibility of Edward Snowden having got himself from Hong Kong to Moscow airport. Like, these tools actually do work if you're competent and if you know how to use them, otherwise that guy would have disappeared and would be in supermax in the United States by now. So we're not promising to teach you that stuff, and you shouldn't trust us if we did. Um, but it's just to give you a little bit of an idea that these tools, when used correctly, actually can protect you from some of the most powerful and determined adversaries in the world, which we hope to never come up against. But one of the reasons, I guess, that we're here, and I'm just kind of in closing, is that tools of surveillance have been turned against civil society organisations, journalists, 
public servant whistleblowers, Occupy movement, climate change demonstrators, people who might want to put their arms in a pipe, you know, in East Gippsland or forests elsewhere, and that is completely inappropriate, and that's one of the reasons why we think it's important to share these skills. So, I'm going to invite Jamie back up to introduce our next guest, and I'm very much looking forward to hearing what he's got to say.